friend of mine was in Iraq. He was a journalist together with the with, uh, American military, and he's the bureau chief of the New York Times. His name is Jeffrey Gettleman. And he was kidnapped. I got a call from his dad. About the worst news you could get. Of course, I remembered my experience when I was told that Dan was killed. And like I said, it was the worst day of my life. It took me a long time. I did not have to do my grief day to help figure it out. So Jeff was kidnapped as one of my best friends, and it was at a time when they were cutting people's heads off. And this guy happens to be Jewish. Um, he was in Fallujah. It was a very hot spot. And I started wondering, and I grew up with this guy. I started wondering if what I'm doing with my life is with as much courage. Am I taking the risks I need to take? Am I doing as much for other people as he is? He is literally risking his life to tell the stories of people whose voices would otherwise not be heard. And he might die for it. And I'm in an air-conditioned editing room looking at, you know, happy research and, and, and some amazing footage from Open on. I thought, oh, is this the right thing for me to do? I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm educated. Maybe I can do more. Then I came across some research that helped recalibrate it. It said essentially that happiness isn't only good for you as an individual, but it's good for those people around you, it's good for our communities and the world. What it says is happy people are less likely to cheat. They're less likely to commit crimes, to hurt somebody, to mug somebody, to rape somebody. They're more likely to find a creative solution to problems. They're more likely to find a way to get along. They're less likely to pollute the environment. They're more likely to advocate for justice and compassion. And I realize that everything that I care about, when I read the newspaper and I wish I could make a difference, when I read about famine or injustice or war, everything, religious uh, strife, all of those things are made better if people are happier. Now, I don't mean to simplify it. I know that some of these issues can be complex, but the point is, Happy people are much less likely to do these things that I wish didn't exist in our world. And a few days later, Jeff called me himself, and he said he was held at gunpoint, and he thought he was going to die, and he was okay. And a few months ago, he wanted to give a surprise. I was not taught about those values when I was in school. Compassion, love, how important it is to be nice to people, how important it is to feel connected. As I experienced it making this film, it started to dawn on me that this isn't something that you do as a byproduct of your life. You don't do it when you're finished with your work day, but when you're finished achieving what you want to in business. You do it while you are achieving what you want to in your life. In school, I was taught to compete. Some teachers even said at the beginning of the semester, they said, I'm going to give out three A's. Maybe it's five. They said, you guys got to scramble for it. It encouraged people not to help each other. It encouraged people to feel separate from each other and to feel like we're not in this together. In fact, we're all in this alone. The science is showing that's not the way we actually interact. We are in this together in many, many ways. I went to see a scientist. I wanted to know what is the sort of pinnacle of science? What does that say about happiness? You know, there's, there's psychologists and there's studies that, are, that, that study people. But I don't know what's the hardest science there is. So I went to see a guy named Richard Davidson at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And he has the, uh, the biggest lab studying emotion in the brain for the longest period of time, so like 35 years. So he puts people in functional MRI scanners, brain scanners, and he discovers amazing things. Like, they know exactly what part of your brain is active during happiness. Now, again, I don't mean happiness like, ha ha, when I good. I mean happiness like a deeper sense of joy and contentment. Even if something's going wrong, you still feel something that's worth being there for and being excited about. The left prefrontal cortex is the area of the brain that's actually doing happiness. They don't know exactly what's happening, but it's sort of surprising to me. Wow, some people have more activity in their natural area than those people who are supposed to be When they know that, they can then learn what activity stimulates this left prefrontal um, uh, activity. And they discover that, I said, that's okay, what is the trick? What's like the best one? What's the best exercise to make people happy? And the last thing I expected to hear was Tibetan Buddhist meditation. Mm -hmm. Literally, the last, I would have thought he would have said, you know, uh, crossword puzzles or, you know, uh, watching movies that are, that are inspiring or something like that. He said there's a specific form of Tibetan meditation that not only stimulates activity there, but in only two weeks of doing this, you physically change the thickness of that part of your brain. It's literally like working out, right? You don't have to believe that doing this with a weight is going to make your arms stronger, but it happens. That's just the way your body works. 
You don't have to believe in meditation, but if you do it, it works. So I was sort of blown away by this my Christian friend. He said, hey, you got it. Like, this is true, I have to try it. So we signed up for a retreat, but we went, and I, I want to give you guys a brief version of how it works, because it will reveal what this is all about. It's not about religion at all. There was no pictures of uh, Tibetan gods or goddesses with big teeth and fire. It was, just a, it was just a place to sit. And the instructor said, uh, think of that feeling you have when you were at the, just the most blissful state you've ever been. Seeing your child born, lying with the person you love in bed on a Sunday morning when you have nothing to do. Whatever it is, like winning your first prize in whatever you really care. Whatever it is, but that feeling where you just be. Now, think of that feeling while you say to yourself three or four things that are sort of good vibes. For example, I wish myself health, happiness, and a peaceful life. That's what I mean. So for 20 minutes, you sit there with your eyes sort of halfway closed, and you're in a relaxed position, you do it in a chair on the floor. And you say, I wish myself, and you really mean it. And you think of that good feeling. So, okay, great. You know, you're not concentrating on bad stuff, so 10 minutes you feel kind of better. Then you take a little break, and then you do it for 20 minutes for somebody you love. I wish Kathy, who is a mother to me now, my mother was excellent, but I have another one now. Uh, I wish Kathy health, happiness, and a peaceful life. And that's kind of fun because you begin to think about something you love, and you can imagine that sort of stimulate bond, bonds and good feelings. Then you take another break, then you do it for somebody you don't know. Somebody on the news, somebody you saw on the bus that day, somebody you know, who you bought coffee for from that morning. And that's kind of weird to really think about somebody. It's a little creepy, but don't worry, it's not creepy. Think about that person for 20 minutes and genuinely wish them. Then you take another break, and then the other Do that for somebody you hate. Somebody who has hurt you. Somebody who has hurt somebody you love. It doesn't have to be current. It could be from your childhood, from your kid's childhood, from your friend's childhood. Or somebody you wish did not exist. And genuinely, for 20 minutes, wish them health, happiness, and peaceful life. And you can imagine that's challenging. Then you take another break. Then you do it for all living beings on Earth. Now let me just clarify what happens there. By building your bond to other beings, the ones you love, the ones you don't know, the ones you hate, and all the ones you may never meet. By building that strength, that connection, you become happier and you change your brain. And again, it's not happening to last for that period, it lasts for weeks afterwards. It can last for weeks from the first session. If you do it for a long period of time, even when you stop, it can last for months or even years after that. That just kind of blew me away. Like loving people makes you happier. I was exposed to the idea that you love people when everything in your life is good. You know, like on the airplane, when that airbag thing comes down, you're supposed to put it on yourself first. I think the Dalai Lama said something great. He said, uh, if you want to make somebody else happy, help them. If you want to make yourself happy, help someone else. It's the same answer. When I was a kid, I remember seeing this picture for the first time. It's called Earthrise. It was taken the year before astronauts landed on the moon. And it reminded me that, or it showed me for the first time, to be honest, that all of these barriers that I feel every day, even in school I felt, racially, economically, language-wise, politically, culturally, all of these things that sort of separate us are, don't exist from just a little bit of perspective. I didn't know the model's way, but it's a little bit of and I thought of a person when I, and I just looked this up recently, I thought of an experience I had, one of the last interviews I did for a friend of mine's movie. We got to interview a, a historian named Howard Zinn. Anybody know Howard Zinn? Okay, we wrote a book, for those of you who don't know, we wrote a book called The People's History of the United States, and essentially studied history from the perspective of people who didn't live in the wars, who were oppressed from slaves, from indigenous Americans, people who didn't get their voices put up on the banner of what history is. And I, and, and I asked him, he was 80, in his 80s when I asked him, I said, you study all of these incredible things, political movements, revolutions, ideologies, social upheaval, communism, capital, everything, you studied it all. You looked at it from that perspective. What does it all mean? Is there some morsel of wisdom, is there some morsel of truth that I don't know, that my generation needs to know? And I was pretty sure he was going to say, oh, it's too complicated, it depends, you know, you tell you about ancient China or you know, contemporary America or New York City. He said, oh, absolutely, there's one thing that people don't know. I said, like, oh, it's amazing, right? As a doctor, I come in and you want that somebody, and I felt embarrassed to be asking for it. He said, people don't understand the power of the individual voice. He said, when Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, he did not promise to free slaves when he was campaigning for president. That's not the reason why he got there. It wasn't his idea. He became president. He was
was thinking about it, like so many other people. And finally, somebody said, I know this is wrong. And they told one of their best friends. And they formed a group. And the group was probably exactly this size at some point. And then it grew and it grew. And finally, they said, Mr. President, if you don't do something about freeing the slaves, you're out of there. He said, all the, the, the major political movements in history can be traced back to individual voices coming together. I was not taught history like that at all. I thought it was a big important person who made a decision that we all follow. It made you realize that everything we do, every gesture we make, has an impact. And that, and that being conscious of happiness is not something that's selfish. When I started making this movie, I thought that my happiness was about me. I was going to gain tools for me. And it's not about me, it's about us. Thank you very much. <laughs>